So in the third uh, video lesson on panel data models, um, I will discuss some extensions to the classic uh, fixed effects and uh, random effects approaches. So I will first start with some uh, useful uh, specification tests that can we have already encountered pre before, but uh, we can adapt them to the panel data context. Okay. So firstly, we were left off with the uh, with random effects model and. Uh, uh, Recall that this uh, state output of the random effects regression didn't really provide any kind of um, test that whether these uh, firm specific heterogeneity terms U are significant or not. So in the fixed effects context, there was already F test was uh, automatically reported. Uh, uh, for the random effects, on the other hand, uh, uh, this um, time invariant UI they actually then relate to the heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation of the composite error term epsilon tilde. So therefore, we can utilize similar tests as we did earlier in the context of, uh, of heteroscedasticity. So for example, the uh, so-called Broich-Pagan Lagrange multiplier test could be used. So this is possible, for example, uh, do just in the case of the, the stata output. So, um, one point I want to mention at this point that if you're wondering that why do I uh, utilize so heavily, for example, this data uh, software, if uh, you are free to choose any, any software whatsoever, uh, there's two points. One thing is that uh, many of this, uh, these, um, for example, specification tests are readily available in Stata, so it's convenient to, to utilize that rather than compute this kind of test manually. And secondly, I also want to, to uh, encourage you to utilize this, uh, this uh, uh, what you have learned in this course, because, uh, for example, this data output indicates that uh, it's quite easy to, to read this kind of uh, uh, output of the test. If you understand that what is the null hypothesis, for example, here it's quite clear that uh, the null hypothesis is that the variance of u is equal to zero, and then you have this test statistic uh, which follows the g squared distribution with one degrees of freedom, and then you state actually reports the p value for this test also automatically. So by using these kind of uh, examples of uh, uh, topics that also that go a little bit further away from the this uh, this lesson, I want you to encourage you also to to uh, to, to to be brave and, and experiment also with this kind of models that perhaps we haven't really considered in this course, because uh, uh, if you understand the basics of uh, one test, you can you can easily apply it to the, another kind of tests. And uh, this is very, very easy if you have some kind of statistical software, such as data, but wh whatever software you might have, which which uh, readily report the test statistics and p-values. So, so don't hesitate and don't be scared to utilize this kind of uh, kind of tests. So anyway, they are based on very similar principles that we have studied already before. Okay, so that's the point of, of using this kind of uh, uh, stata output. Not to advertise stata, but uh, just to illustrate that what you can do and how you can utilize the, the uh, lessons from this, uh, this course also in other contexts. Here's another example that uh, we can utilize something that we have already learned before in a slightly different context. So here comes the Hausmann test again. So remember, we already utilized the Hausmann test earlier uh, when we were testing this uh, instrumental variable regression relative to the classic OLS specification. So the situation is very similar here. In fact, if we want to compare fixed effects uh, versus random effects model. So we have two, two alternative estimators so the fixed effects uh, estimator uh, is consistent uh, even if we have endogeneity, whereas the random effects estimator is uh, consistent if the null hypothesis of uh, uh, no endogeneity, in other words, uh, that uh, explanatory variables and, uh, and uh, heterogeneity U are uncorrelated. So if that null hypothesis holds, then uh, the random effects estimator is uh, more efficient than the fixed effects estimator. But if this uh, key assumption of the random effects estimator fails, then only the fixed effects estimator is consistent. 
So therefore, like in the case of instrumental variables versus OLS, we can then use the Hausmann test to, to, to test the specification empirically. So the null hypothesis uh, here is, stated, stated, is stating that difference in coefficients not systematic. In, in fact, it means that, uh, that uh, UI is correlated with the explanatory variables of the regression. Okay, so that means there is no endogeneity. And like in the case of this uh, testing instrumental variables, then we effectively compare these uh, uh, coefficients and their standard uh, error. So in this data output, uh, uh, you can compare to the previous uh, slides that, uh, that to see that this, uh, we have these uh, uh, coefficients of the fixed effects estimator for OPEX and capital stock, and then the random effects estimators and then Stata computes their difference and this, uh, this um, standard errors. And there's also the formula for the, for the test statistic. Uh, so it is this uh, G-squared. Uh, so the value of the test statistic is 28.96. And uh, that's the p-value 0 0.000. So that means that uh, uh, with uh, any usual significance level of 5% or 1% uh, significance, uh, we can reject the null hypothesis. So now, of course, what, what is then left for the user is to then make the right conclusion. What does it mean if we reject the null hypothesis, which model we should, uh, we should utilize? So in effect, we are here testing that are these coefficients of fixed effects and random effects model uh, different enough to, to argue that uh, there must be uh, endogeneity present. So if there is just this kind of, uh, if both models are consistent, uh, then we would expect this uh, fixed effects and random effects to yield very similar coefficients. Only difference would be the, from the greater efficiency of the random effects. So this is what we are in effect testing here with the Hausmann test. So are these coefficients similar enough to be attributed to the to the greater efficiency of the random effects, or are there are there kind of more systematic differences that would point towards the endogeneity problem? So when we reject the null hypothesis, as in this case, then we conclude that indeed uh, the null hypothesis that uh, that um, that uh, both models are consistent and there is no endogeneity problem can be rejected. So therefore, uh, we would choose in favor of the fixed effects model based on the Hausmann test. Okay. If on the other hand, the null hypothesis was maintained, then uh, we would choose in favor of the random effects because under the null hypothesis, the random effects would be a more efficient estimator. So this also illustrates that we do not need to make this choice between fixed effects or random effects uh, uh, from the outset based on some kind of uh, assumption, but rather we can test empirically that uh, which specification uh, is better using the, the Hausmann test. So whether the null hypothesis of the random effects can be maintained or not. Okay, so then another point then, I want to come back to this uh, firm specific UI term. So earlier I mentioned that if we have this intercept term so we cannot really identify this intercept term or we have otherwise we have to normalize it so that, for example, these uh, heterogeneity terms UI uh, sum to zero. But that's to some extent an arbitrary normalization. And uh, in some studies, actually, these, uh, these uh, firm specific UI are, are the main objective of interest in the study. And this is often, for example, if you are interested in the productivity differences between the firms or, or efficiency differences. So, so, so uh, um, we can think about this UI as some, some time invariant uh, productive inefficiency of the, of the firms. And uh, there is this interesting idea by Peter Schmidt and Robin Sickles already from the 1980s to then, then after estimating these UIs, uh, we, can, we can normalize them. So, that, uh, that uh, the best performing firm or the most efficient firm gets the UI equal to zero. And then, then we compare this kind of efficiency differences relative to that firm, because always this kind of uh, 
technical efficiency in some sense is always relative to some kind of performance norm. So why not utilize then the the most efficient uh, firm in the in the sample as the as the as the benchmark? and then compare performance relative to that firm. So then, then we can get, for example, some relative uh, uh, efficiency measures to, to, to the best performing firm. So indeed, that would be falling to the, to the topic of uh, efficiency analysis. Uh, and if you're more interested in the efficiency analysis, there is also this kind of uh, special course uh, called uh, uh, productivity and efficiency analysis. Uh, um, I think it's no longer organized under that uh, that name, but it should be still available in in my courses, and uh, and uh, we still probably organize it later with the, uh, with this kind of current topics uh, label. So further information about that kind of uh, estimation is available in this uh, this productivity and efficiency analysis course. So this uh, Smith and Sickles interpretation, of course. Um, uh, makes a relatively strong assumption that these uh, these uh, uh, heterogeneity terms U I that first of all they are due to this kind of uh, efficiency differences between companies. Another strong assumption here is that uh, this U I are time invariant. So there is a quite st large stream of uh, so-called frontier estimation models where also this U I is made uh, time varying. So. One of the most popular specification is the so-called Battisi and Coelli model from the early 90s, where there is some specific parameterization of this, uh, this uh, uh, time varying uh, F inefficiency term UI. So uh, notice that these frontier models uh, typically then need some kind of very specific distributional assumption. So, so in this kind of models, uh, the, the noise term V is assumed to be normally distributed and in this specific model, then this UI term has a so-called truncated normal distribution. Uh, so we will come back to this kind of truncated distributions in the next theme when we talk about the limited dependent variables. But as a, as a sort of uh, to pave a way towards this uh, limited dependent variable models, I'll, I'll just illustrate to you this uh, Battisi Coelli model uh, estimation in, in Stata. So uh, notice that also that, uh, that uh, like I mentioned, that it's very easy to experiment with Stata or similar statistical software, different types of models. So if there's some kind of model library, you can, you can quite easily, if you have uploaded the data, you can just uh, try different kinds of models. So here is this uh, results of the uh, Battisi and Coelli model that I have just, uh, just uh, um, estimated for as an example. So this uh, estimation of the frontier models uh, uses so-called maximum likelihood technique, and this will be the form from the topic of the of the this twelfth uh, theme when we talk about this uh, limited dependent variables in more detail. And uh, this kind of maximum likelihood uh, approach can be used for especially when we have some highly parameterized uh, models, where, for example, there was this. Uh, this uh, composite error term consisting of this uh, uh, normally distributed noise and uh, truncated normal inefficiency term that uh, changes over time. So I don't go through all of the parameters in detail, but uh, it's particularly this eta parameter in this uh, middle part of this. So there's eta minus 0 0.078. So that eta parameter is this coefficient of this uh, time varying uh, inefficiency term. And uh, it appears that there is indeed some kind of significant time varying component in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this inefficiency term UI. So in in this frontier model, this uh, this uh, heterogeneity UI is interpreted as as uh, as uh, inefficiency. But that's just just an interpretation or or an assumption in in itself. Okay. Another way to extend this, uh, this kind of uh, beyond the traditional fixed effects and uh, random effects models is to then utilize this, um, let's say, more time, time series uh, type approaches. For example, uh, allow for autocorrelation in the error term. So typically, this kind of time series uh, type of modeling comes in the, 
in the panel data model where this uh, time horizon is relatively small. So uh, traditionally, usually this uh, panel data models had a relatively large number of firms or individuals or countries, but the time horizon was relatively short, mainly because of data availability. But nowadays there also exists this kind of panel data where, where the time dimension can be relatively long. So that opens the door to integrate this kind of time series analysis techniques to the, to the panel data models. And a simple way would be, for example, introduce some kind of autocorrelation if, if that is needed. Uh, so here is an illustration of the random effects uh, estimation with the uh, uh, autoregressive uh, error term. And uh, this is just the same kind of uh, regression output uh, as, the, as we earlier discussed with the, in the context of random effects. So this is a GLS, generalized least squares estimation, where this autocorrelation coefficient come in, the, in this uh, result is this uh, uh, bottom part of the table where there is this uh, raw AR. So that is this autocorrelation coefficient estimated for this uh, autocorrelated uh, error term V. And in, it turns out that also in this uh, electricity distribution application that there is quite high value of this uh, autocorrelation coefficient, surprisingly high autocorrelation of 0 0.76778. And uh, that can be also, also something to take into account if the, if the time horizon is long enough. Of course, um, I should add that in this application, we have only eight uh, eight uh, years of data so that's not the best case perhaps for using this kind of more time series modeling but anyway i wanted to illustrate this possibility then finally one more extension that has been has been quite uh, popular in recent decades is also to model more explicitly the the um, uh, dynamics so remember that we talked about this uh, dynamic time series models uh, and uh, uh, as also as an alternative to modeling autocorrelation in the data. So um, uh, it's also possible to introduce this kind of lacked value of the dependent variable y in the model. Uh, here I should note that I should also have the log logarithm of y on the right hand side to be consistent on the, with the notation. So apologies for this uh, notational inconsistency. So there should be also a log of y in, in front of the gamma parameter. Anyway, this, uh, this gamma coefficient is here, this kind of auto, um, autoregressive component uh, for, this, uh, for this panel data. So again, if the panel, panel data has a sufficiently long time horizon, then it's possible to do this kind of dynamic panel data model. However, there come some kind of uh, obvious uh, difficulties. Uh, uh, notice that if this... Um, or in, in fact, in this case, this, uh, this uh, time invariant heterogeneity term ui obviously correlates with this u, u imperial t minus 1 because uh, u imperial, sorry, u, ui and y imperial t minus 1, uh, because y imperial t minus 1 also contains this ui, so clearly they must be correlated. So we definitely have the endogeneity problem here. And... Uh, also, this in, in, in this kind of dynamic model, when we have this lacked dependent variable also used as an explanatory variable, then uh, the fixed effects estimator cannot be used. So perhaps one reason why these dynamic panel data models have been, have been very popular is that, uh, that uh, it also then opens the door for using the instrumental variable techniques to estimating them. And uh, in the case of panel data, we have, of course, uh, uh, possibility to use these lacked values as the instrument. So if you take uh, the lacked one period lack for this auto autoregressive part, then, then we have two period lacks. So yi in period t minus two, and perhaps yi in period t minus three, and so on, could be potentially useful instruments for, for yi in period t minus one. So uh, these are commonly referred to as the Arellano bond instruments, referring to the authors who, who proposed uh, using them. So just to illustrate, I have, I have here also run this uh, dynamic panel data model in Stata and using these uh, uh, so-called Arellano bond instruments as, as this also, 
also also as data illustrates and uh, we have used uh, used indeed this uh, these uh, lacked values of the of the uh, operational expenditure and and capital as the as the instruments so i don't go to the to the very much into to the uh, details just this kind of notice that this uh, first coefficient is 0 0.073 so that is this uh, lacked output variable uh, which is uh, this autoregressive coefficient and uh, and then we have this operational expenditure and capital stock uh, as as usually there so so the point of using the instrumental variables is that because this lacked output variable contains obviously this time invariant ui so therefore we have the endogeneity problem and we need to use some instruments to identify this lacked variable. So notice now that when we use these differences, uh, uh, if you look at these observations per group, so, so this time horizon becomes very, very short. So we had originally uh, eight observations. Uh, taking this uh, one period lag decreases the number of time periods to seven. And then we still need these instruments from the uh, period t minus two. So in total, we have only six periods here in this this case. So so that also might explain why this uh, uh, autoregressive coefficient is not significant in this dynamic panel data model. And I emphasize that I mainly mainly run this dynamic panel data model in this this specific application to illustrate this possibility. But uh, but this kind of uh, dynamic panel data models then. Uh, fall beyond the scope of the of the present course. I also wanted to illustrate that okay, some 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 ideas of what is this dynamic panel data models and Arellano model model do because uh, uh, very often some uh, master's thesis students were asking me uh, to help uh, with this with this modeling. So so um, I wanted to illustrate that what 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 is it used for and uh, so that you have an idea that. Is it potentially useful in your study or not? If you do, for example, bachelor thesis or master's thesis, but uh, this otherwise this falls beyond the scope of the of the of the present course. So uh, we don't go to the theory of the dynamic panel data models in more more detail. Okay, so that completes the the uh, different types of um, extensions uh, for this lecture. So here I have simply just the summarize the empirical results of the of the different results so notice that this uh, in this present application at least the the way that the panel data was modeled made quite a big difference to the to the output elasticities of uh, operational expenditure and capital stock and also there is scale elasticity which is just the sum of these two two output elasticities and uh, um if I would try to think of what, which kind of uh, results, we, results of which model make most sense, uh, then uh, uh, I would I would expect the scale elasticity in this kind of uh, um, this kind of industry. Uh, we typically expect that there should be economies of scale. So in some sense, the uh, results of the fixed effects model strike me a little bit odd because uh, that would suggest that there's a really uh, strong diseconomies of scale and uh, also this very small coefficient of operational expenditure is somewhat uh, somewhat uh, uh, surprising perhaps uh, it's it's uh, possible that because of the endogeneity problem the pooled regression has uh, has um, has um, biased uh, towards zero in this coefficient of the capital stock so that would be the usual uh, usual uh, symptom of the endogeneity problem. If, if the capital stock has uh, endogeneity, then uh, then we would expect it to have downward biased coefficient here. But also the, in some sense, the pooled regression would give most meaningful scale elasticity estimate also. So based on these results, my conclusion would be that uh, it's probably this uh, Cobb-Douglas functional form is not appropriate because in some sense, none of these uh, models actually yield very, very credible results in my my experience. But uh, modeling more more beyond going beyond the Cobb Douglas production function falls beyond the scope of the present course. So 
we have reached then the final theme of the course. So as I mentioned already before there, uh, we will next look into the maximum likelihood estimation and utilize it to model limited dependent variables. So for example, when the dependent variable is, uh, is a binary zero one variable, or when there is some kind of truncated or truncation or censoring in the, in the dependent variable Y. So that's also still a quite uh, fascinating theme. So thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next video.